20 years ago, I was at my Princeton reunion when someone said hi. I recognized him immediately, not because I remembered him from college, but because I had seen his photo recently as Time Magazine's Person of the Year. It was Jeff Bezos. We chatted briefly, but I remember trying to get out of the conversation quickly. I didn't want him to ask me too many questions. At the time, he was the face of tech success, and I had left my job as a health policy consultant to be a stay-at-home mom and was struggling with reunion small talk and feelings of not measuring up. I knew that I was generally happy with my life, and I felt a sense of purpose, but successful, I wasn't sure. After being at Milton Academy, Princeton, and Harvard Business School, I was questioning the belief that success was all about achievement, status, and money. These external measures are defined on a relative scale. We are a success if we rank ourselves higher than others. So we compare ourselves, which is what I did at my reunion. My focus then was on mundane aspects of life with two toddlers, play dates, meal prep, bedtime routines. Traditional measures didn't apply to me. I didn't want to measure my success by tasks I got done or where my kids got into school. San Francisco preschools were notoriously competitive. <clears throat> I started contemplating. Am I enough? What makes a successful life? I wanted a way to think about success that was relevant and meaningful. As a society, we place a lot of emphasis on specific types of achievement, getting good grades, being accepted at top-tier schools, landing a high-paying job. But why? We assume these accomplishments will make us feel good about ourselves. But the reality is that they don't necessarily make us feel happy or fulfilled. We know this because for the last 84 years, the Harvard study of adult development has been tracking how people feel about their lives. One of their key findings is that people who built wealth, had prestigious jobs, or became famous did not report more life satisfaction than those with fewer achievements. A study of CEOs showed that they experience more depression and anxiety than the general public. We don't hear about CEOs often, as much as we hear of others like Michael Phelps and Simone Biles, who shared their mental health issues after reaching the pinnacle of their sports. This doesn't mean that achieving external success is never fulfilling. It depends on whether it relates to what matters to us. As an example, let's look at the story of Andre Agassi, the tennis great. Agassi started playing tennis as a child, pushed into the sport by his father. Looking back, he says he didn't really know himself or what mattered to him, but he worked hard and became the top-ranked tennis player in the world. In an interview, he said, I thought that getting to the number one was going to be the moment I made sense of my life, but it left me a little empty. He started abusing drugs, his marriage collapsed, and his tennis ranking dropped to number 141. Then something changed. He was watching an episode of 60 Minutes that showed how charter schools in under-resourced communities were transforming students' lives. The story inspired him. He founded and financed Agassiz Prep, a charter school in Las Vegas. This was my reason for being out there, he said. With new motivation, he climbed back up the rankings to number one, this time with a feeling of fulfillment. So what made the difference for Agassiz? He followed his own internal compass for success. He got clear on his values, and his values inspired his goals and guided his actions. If we all want to improve our mental health, and lead fulfilling lives, then we must develop our own internal compass for success. Here's what I mean. 
A compass helps us navigate by orienting us toward magnetic north. In life, our values provide that guidance. They help us make choices and set our priorities. They reflect what matters most to us. But we don't typically learn how to identify them. As Agassiz found, it can be hard to separate what we value from the noise of what others say is important. So let's take a moment for you to contemplate your values. One way is to think of a peak moment in your life when you felt really energized or fulfilled. Consider what made you feel that way and what value might be underneath that. Another way is to look at everyday moments. Think of a time this past week when you felt really good about something that you did. Maybe you made progress on a difficult project or helped a friend who was struggling. Reflect on why that moment was important to you. If it was about a tough project, maybe you value challenges or perseverance. If it was helping a friend, maybe it's connection or compassion. Once we're clear on our values, we can use that information to guide us. We can set goals that resonate with who we are at our core. Agassiz's goal became supporting students at his charter school, and tennis was a means to that end. Research confirms the importance of this type of intrinsic motivation. Dr. Ruth Gautian, author and chief learning officer at Cornell Medicine, studied Olympic athletes, astronauts, and Nobel Prize winning scientists. She found that one of the attributes these people share is working on things they believe are important, interesting, and have an impact. In other words, their goals matter to them and are connected to their values. Take a moment to reflect on your goals. Imagine yourself 20 or maybe 50 years from now, looking back on your life. Think of what will make you feel proud or like your life has been a success. Maybe you have goals related to your financial situation or relationships, or sharing your creativity. Now we have an, our magnetic north and some direction. But just as in the wilderness, a compass doesn't help us if it sits in our pocket. We need to use it to course correct frequently. That means making sure that our actions align with our values. It means broadening our definition of success to think about how we're being as well as what we're doing. Dr. Robert Waldinger, the director of the Harvard study I mentioned earlier, learned from his own research that what gives people the most satisfaction in life is relationships. He realized this is one of his values, and so he made course corrections in how he spends his time. He started reaching out more often to friends to strengthen those personal connections, which he values more than his academic awards. Agassiz did the same, changing his behavior as he worked toward his goals. What do you notice about the alignment between your behavior and your values? Think of what course corrections you might want to make With our internal compass, we can navigate life defining success on our own terms. We don't need to compare ourselves to others. My hope is that as we think about success differently, we'll start to talk about it differently as well. And that can change our communities. We still tend to define people by what they've achieved. Simone Biles defined herself that way. After withdrawing from the Tokyo Olympics, she tweeted, the outpouring of love and support I've received 
has made me realize I'm more than my accomplishments and gymnastics, which I never truly believed before. Let's see ourselves and others as more than our accomplishments. Let's try to understand what people value. Let's acknowledge and celebrate their strengths and character. I keep going to reunions. I haven't seen Jeff Bezos again. And I'm not as concerned about being judged or judging others' success. Conversations with classmates are less about what do you do and more about how are you, really? I continue to define success based on my internal compass and being true to myself. After all, I'm a graduate of Milton, where our motto is dare to be true. I urge you to dare to be true to your definition of success by clarifying your values, defining your own goals, and paying attention to how you are being as you navigate life. Let your own compass be your guide. Thank you.